Okay, uh, we are continuing on here. Um, last time we kind of jumped a little bit ahead of some of the notes and kind of talked about uh, really dimensional analysis to do a conversion type problem. So a reminder that uh, we can have what's referred to as an inequality. The quality again is uh, basically two values that are on different units, but represent the same thing. And from any equality, we really can write two conversion factors from them, which are really just fractions. So for example, we can write 12 inches as one foot, or one foot is 12 inches. When we do a problem, uh, kind of doing it through dimensional analysis, which is how you can do it, it's really about units, canceling units, and it's all about really multiplying and dividing. And pretty much to cancel any unit that you don't want, uh, you basically got to put it in the opposite location. And any unit that you uh, basically want to keep should not cancel out in the end. So once again, if we had uh, 43.5 inches and we want to know how many feet that would be, uh, we would start with the 43.5 inches. Once again, we would pick the conversion factor where the inches are in the opposite location. Once again, it is not really written as a fraction, but you can kind of visualize that the inches are up on top, which means the correct conversion factor to use would be the one on the right, where they're in the opposite location. One foot is 12 inches. What we're essentially doing, like we talked about last time, is we're multiplying across the top. We're coming back and dividing by the bottom here. And when we do that, the inches on top will divide out basically the inches on the bottom. And in this particular case, we'll end up with 43.5 divided by the 12. It says 3.625 feet. In terms of significant figures, as we talked about, this is again, a really an English to English conversion, uh, which means it's considered an exact number which means you really don't have to worry about the significant figures there in that particular conversion. Uh, that means really the only sig figs you've got to worry about are really the original number there that has three, which means really this should end up at three, which means here we would then round up in this case, and we should end up with 3.63 if I remember uh, feet in this particular case. When we're dealing with uh, Equalities or conversion factors that are really uh, English to English conversion factors, like what we see up here, or if they are metric to metric uh, sort of conversion factors, like a thousand grams to kilogram, uh, those are really considered exact numbers. You really only have to worry about if you do kind of cross over metric to English or vice versa. Uh, you really should look at sort of the significant figures in that conversion factor. And when you do, there will always be in a conversion factor, a one is one of something equals something else, basically. Uh, obviously, you would not look at the one. You would look at the other number that's there in terms of considering the significant figures that would be there. Um, there are a couple sort of metric to English ones you don't really have to worry about. One inch is 2.54 centimeters exactly. Uh, not everybody, but some people throw the one pound is 453.6 grams. So sometimes people consider those exact uh, sort of uh, conversion. Any questions about that? Yeah. Um, there's three There's three six figs because the nice thing about sort of dimensional analysis, these type of conversion problems, is basically the only sort of math operation you're doing is multiplying or dividing. So you're always going to be looking at significant figures. And in this particular case, the conversion factor of one foot over 12 inches is considered an exact number. So you don't have to worry about it uh, because exact numbers can have unlimited number of significant figures. So if you pretty much ignore those. Uh, so that leaves us again, just the original number there that had three six figs, and that's how we end up. All right, so here are some uh, equalities and, and things. Uh, again, we have our metric to metric guys here, like our kilometers to meters, our millimeters to meters. So once again, all of these sort of equalities, every single one you could write two conversion factors for. So for example, 
you chose that one, you could say one liter is uh, 1,000 milliliters or 1,000 milliliters is one liter. So again, those are the two conversion factors that you can get from that particular quality. All these down here, which are metric to metric, once again, would be considered exact numbers. So in a calculation, you wouldn't have to be concerned about uh, the significant figures that are there from using a conversion factor from there. These are all English to English or, met, or uh, US to US, however you want to say that. Uh, all these here as well would be considered exact numbers. And so once again, if you use some type of conversion factor that came from those equalities, you can basically ignore it in the calculation. Uh, you don't have to worry about the same thing. It really is only when you get to sort of this sort of uh, section here, um, you do need to take them into consideration. The one that I guess your book uses is just the inches there. So the one inch is 2.54 centimeters. That's still an exact. So you wouldn't have to worry about the significant figures there. But let's just say that you chose uh, this guy right here. The two conversion factors that you would use or could get from that is there's 473 milliliters in one pint or the opposite one pint would have 473 milliliters. If you were to use this in a calculation like you did just previously, a calculation like that, you would want to look at the significant figures here of this conversion factor and decide is it more or less than everything may help us there. And again, you wouldn't look at obviously at both numbers in this case. Uh, you would look at the, real, the only number that's there. Uh, you would look at this number. The other number obviously is one, so you wouldn't look at it, but you would look at it and go, okay, this conversion factor has three significant figures. Is that more or less than maybe the original number? And that's the only time where, technically speaking, if you're using a conversion factor, if it crosses over metric to English, you really should look at the uh, significant figures that are there. I will say, even with sort of really looking at a metric to English conversion factor and taking it into consideration, I will not say a hundred times, but if all you are doing is a conversion problem where you're just using conversion factors to come convert units, more times than not, if you kind of roll with the uh, sig figs on that original number, you're probably almost going to be good in most cases. Again, not 100% foolproof, but 90th percent of the time, you'll probably be pretty good, uh, you know, are pretty darn close to the right number of sig figs. So most of the time, these guys also end up being actually more sig figs than you start with. Not 100% time, but, you know, more times than not. So we're going to kind of go through this a little quicker because we did obviously talk about conversion factors if you're going on a big tangent and start doing some problems and stuff like that. But again, uh, just basically just two fractions. And obviously, we would not use uh, both of them in a problem. We would use just the one that we need. If you use both of them in a problem, you just undid your conversion, basically. So you would never, ever use them both in the same problem because uh, you would uh, obviously undo that. So once again here, this is our metric to English uh, sort of conversion. So in this case, you would probably look at the 2.20 if you were doing it in a calculation. Uh, up here on top, this is metric to metric, so you wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, when you're using that type of conversion factor. All right. I'm going to roll through some of these here. Let's take a look at this. A car is uh, traveling at uh, 85 kilometers per hour. Uh, again, uh, sometimes you are given sort of a conversion factor to use in a problem. So whenever you have something per something, that's basically two sets of units. And usually the number stays with the first unit and it's usually one of the second unit. So 85 kilometers per hour means that you could actually write two conversion factors, 85 kilometers over basically one hour or one hour, 85 kilometers. So sometimes conversion factors that you need to use are kind of in the problem itself. In a case like this, uh, we would look at the significant figures of this conversion factor because it's not a true conversion factor or quality. It's specific for this problem, even though we're kind of using it as a conversion factor. So in this case, you would want to look at the 85 there to figure out, you know, stick big wise your answer if you haven't done, done a problem. Uh, a tablet contains 500 milligrams of vitamin C. And once again, we can turn that into two conversion factors, 500 milligrams of vitamin C over one tablet. One tablet is 500 milligrams. The 500 milligrams is measured. It has one sig fig 
and the tablet is exact. So once again, if this wasn't a problem, you would look at the significant figures here. Uh, again, it's not like a true equality, like it's always 12 inches of one foot, right? You know, you have your day type thing. This is obviously specific for that particular problem that you were looking at. Percentages is another very common thing that sometimes we want to convert into a conversion factor to make things easier. And the easiest way to convert a percentage into a conversion factor is frankly to assume that you have a hundred of something. The reason you do that, it keeps the number the same. So if you got 80% on your exam, you probably got 80 out of 100, right? You got 50% on the month, you got 50 out of 100, you got 100%, you got 100 out of 100. So if we had 18% uh, body fat by mass, that would mean that you have 18 kilograms of body fat per 100 kilograms of body mass. That's one conversion factor you get. And obviously here, 100 kilograms of body mass for 18 kilograms of uh, body fat. Here you would look at the 18 in terms of the sig figs in this case. You also could do it as any unit. So if we wanted a more usable unit that we use here in the US, right? We could say something like 18 pounds of fat, right? Per 100 pounds of body mass. So again, that's the same sort of 18%, or you could do 100 pounds of body mass is 18 pounds of fat. So, you know, you could really use whatever unit you want if you have a percentage and it's just going to be the same units up on top and on the bottom. Again, take 18 divided by 100 times by 100 is 18%. So again, that is a, a very common thing uh, to do. Doses as well, uh, Keflex, uh, 250 milligrams capsule. That means in every one capsule, you get 250 milligrams of the medicine mat. Again, here we will look at the sig figs in the sort of measured part of that conversion factor that we would use. And in case it would have two, we would not look at the one here in this case. So as I mentioned, you know, if you do have to use a crossover a metric to English or some type of conversion factor, uh, that is from a problem or just kind of put into the problem, I uh, usually ignore the one part of the conversion factor and look at the other number in terms of six things if you need to uh, look at the questions on that part. Here's a couple of equalities I'll put it up here, but again, uh, one meter, 10 decimeters are two conversion factors. 80% gold would be in 100 grams of jewelry here, and a gallon of gas is 240. That probably was expensive when they wrote this book. Um, so one gallon obviously would be two dollars or forty cents. The line would be around twenty uh, to get that. R one gallon is two dollars and forty cents on the other side there. All right. So we talked about problem solving here. The really the way that we want to do this is what's usually referred to as dimensional analysis. And dimensional analysis, once again, is, is really the way that you should set up these type of problems. And it really is just, you know, unit cancellation, where we go opposite units to cancel out. And basically, again, multiplying whatever's on top and dividing by what's on the bottom, the A's will cancel out, even as unit B is our final unit. By the way, if we have multiple units that we're starting with, like we have, you know, unit A over unit B, and we wanted to convert them both into something else, you know, we would just take one at a time and we'd go something like, you know, unit A is equal to unit C. That would cancel. And then now I want to get rid of B. And if I write it like this, I can clearly see B's on the bottom. So to get rid of it, it actually has to go opposite. So it should go up on top. And I can do something like unit B over unit D, for example, that would cancel that off. That would actually leave me with two units still left over, unit C over unit D. So it's really important to set these things up as really fraction. And again, opposites cancel everything out. Um, so if you set it up, up and down, uh, you can clearly see where the units are and make sure that they can cancel out correctly. So a couple of 
ideas or ways to approach these problems. First off, it's a good idea to write sort of what you're looking for. It's always a good approach. Uh, you should think about the qualities that will get you there. You want to think about the conversion factors that you could use. And then you want to basically set up the problem where you can see the units completely cancel out and obviously give the answer to the proper number of significant figures. When you're doing conversions, there could be multiple pathways to get you to the same answer, depending on what equalities you may grab or what equalities you may use. So there's not always one set pathway that may get you to the answer. There could be different ways to get there. As long as you choose something that is a legitimate sort of uh, conversion factor, not something you just made up. Uh, they all should get you basically to the same answer at the end, maybe slightly off just a little bit of rounding, but really, you know, keep in mind there, there are you know, multiple ways you can kind of get to the same sort of answer. You know, for example, if we were going from uh, hours to seconds, for example, we could start with hours and then go, all right, in one hour, there is uh, 16 minutes in one minute. There are 60 seconds. The hours would cancel, the minutes would cancel, it gives me seconds. You can also, you know, go in one hour, there's like 3,600 seconds, and I am at seconds as well. Again, they both should give me the same answer. Again, there's sometimes different pathways. Uh, you know, if you're going from, say, pounds to grams or grams to pounds or something like that, uh, you may go from, uh, you know, grams. Straight to pounds, you may go from grams maybe to ounces and ounces to pounds. So, again, uh, there could be multiple ways to sort of get somebody somewhere. All right, so let's take a look at this. A person weighs 178 pounds. What is the body mass in kilograms? Uh, so, again, here we would be looking for a way to go from one to the next. So, there's a couple of There's a couple of different ways you could get there. So ultimately we want to go from pounds to kilograms. So one way could be one pound is 453.6 grams. And there is 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So that's one way that you could get there. And if I were to do this, we would start with the 178 pounds. Once again, here I'm going to use my equalities for my conversion factor. So looking at this, this will give me two conversion factors, one pound over 453.6 grams, or 453.6 grams is one pound. Which one should I use, one on the left or one right? I should use one on the right. Pounds are up on top, which means to get rid of them. I want to go opposite, so we will go with 453.6 grams is one, one, one. At this point, if I stopped, I'm going to divide pounds by pounds so they cancel. I am left with units of grams at this point. And I, if I do it and set it up this way, I can clearly see the grams are up on top, which I want to get rid of them, so I do need to put grams where. I do need to put them opposite of it, which would be on the bottom, and I can use this equality, for example, to get me there, which would give me two conversion factors, 1,000 grams is a kilogram, or one kilogram is 1,000 grams. Here we would put our 1,000 grams on the bottom, one kilogram up on top. At this point, the grams and grams will cancel. We are going to multiply everything that's up on top first. So we're gonna take 178, we're gonna times it by 453.6. I'm then gonna hit equals. And then gonna go back and divide by everything that's on the bottom one at a time. I'm gonna divide it by one, hit equals, divide it by a thousand, you really can't do that. Divide it by a thousand, hit equals, and that is going to give me 80.7408 kilograms. Okay. Now, in terms of answer, if we look at this guy here, really an exact number, so I don't have to really work, look at it. 
Uh, technically speaking, this is sort of an exact number, but if we use the 454, which your book might use, it's really not an exact number. So, you know, the way I wrote it, it has four. If you use 454, it has three significant figures. This original number here has three significant figures, which means we should end right about there. The answer here should be 8027 kilograms. So like I said, most of the stuff in the middle probably could ignore in terms of sig figs and look at that first number, but again, one hundred percent of my Now they might have used a different pathway, which it looks like they used kilograms of pounds, a direct sort of conversion. So when they did their direct conversion here, they just went from pounds to kilograms. And you can see they got a slightly different answer because they used a slightly different conversion factor. So the 80 point was a 30.7, they got 80.9. So, you know, fairly close. In this case, uh, this is an exact conversion, so you don't have to worry about it. So we got three sig figs. Our answer ends up uh, with three sig figs. Uh, you do have to worry about the bottom number, which is three sig figs, and now that is three sig figs. So three sig figs here. The top one is an exact number, so you don't have to worry about it. The reason we would consider this conversion factor using this conversion factor is, again, it is a metric to English conversion, so we do have to look at it. And once again, it would be uh, this number we're looking at, which would be three sig figs. And this one also again has three sig figs. So our answer is three sig figs. Questions on that one? Can we round it up? We'll round it up. What's that? We will round the answer up. <clears throat> no, I uh, so I don't know what to see what they get on this. They took uh, 178. It probably just got that number right off of there. So on their calculator, what they got was, uh, if you give this calculation, 80.9090909. Once again, looking, we would go to three sig figs. So in this case, the next number is a zero. So in that case, they just rounded it off. And like I said, that's a different pathway than I took, but basically the same answer at 80.7, going sort of a different pathway. So that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, depending sort of the path you choose, you might get a slightly different answer, and that's okay as long as you chose the you know, correct conversion factors in the long way to do it. Other questions? All right, so uh, rattlesnake is uh, 2.44 meters long. How many centimeters is it? There are 100 centimeters in one meter. So if you're not to go for it, see what you end up with. Okay, uh, so from this here, we can hit two conversion factors. We can have 100 centimeters over one meter, or one meter is 100 centimeters. So we will start with our 2.44 meters. Once again, basically meters are up on top, which means we need to go opposite to cancel. So once again, that is the correct one to use there. That would put the one meter on the bottom, the 100 centimeters up on top. Meters will cancel. And then obviously we're multiplying the top there, 2.44 times 100. Again, give us 
244 centimeters. In this particular case, that's pretty much an exact number, so we don't have to worry about it. Original number had three zig figs. I think three zig figs would have been fine here. Questions on that one? Remember also, uh, <clears throat> We're also that centi is uh, 10 to the minus two. So if you happen to use that version of it, the correct way to do that once again would actually be one centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. So again, that's the way you properly use that, not switching time the opposite way. We'll give you the exact same answer. You would set it up the exact same way, 2.44 meters, except this time you would actually have two to the minus 10 to the minus two meters is one centimeter. When you would put this into your calculator, that basically is one times 10 to the minus two. So you put it in the uh, exponent function like we talked about, and that's how you would put it into your calculator. Okay, so we're going to Now, when we use uh, two or more uh, conversion factors to cancel things out, you may have to go from one to the next. Uh, you can't get answers in between if you're doing multiple sort of steps in a conversion factor. But again, you do want to make sure that if you sort of get an answer and then use it for the next part of the calculation, that you really don't round too much to the very end. So you want to kind of wait to the very end. Uh, here we have a doctor's uh, prescribed dosage of 0.15 uh, milligrams. Uh, if you only needed 50, I think they use the micrograms, right? Uh, if you only have 50 micrograms, tablets and soft, how many tablets would be required here? So we do have a couple conversions that we need to do. We do need to go from really milligrams probably to micrograms or vice versa, because you can't really use them together like that. Um, the conversion factor that we would actually get to use is actually from here. This is basically 50 micrograms per tablet. It's basically the conversion factor R. A tablet, one tablet has 50 micrograms. By the way, I don't know why you're looking at the MC, but that's really the abbreviation for micro. We like that a little for the view. Um, the reason, again, we would need to convert this into micrograms is uh, to make sure all the units properly cancel. So we really can't use those conversion factors the way they are um, without uh, converting one to the next. So we do wanna think about what we need here. And here's a couple of conversion factors. Uh, they actually have one that will go directly to them, uh, milligrams. And I would use my milli conversion here, which basically means in one milligram, there is 10 to the minus three grams. So again, that is how you properly use that for that table. This would then do the conversion that I need, uh, which would be one milligram is 10 to the minus three grams. That is taking it from the prefix unit to the base unit. And if I do that 0.150, and then 10 to the minus one times 10 to the minus three gives me 1.50 times 10 to the minus four grams. I'm in units of grams. This is close to what I need, but once again, I do need micrograms. So now I can easily go to that same table and use the micro conversion to get me there. And in one microgram, there would be 10 to the minus six grams. So once again, that is the proper way to use that conversion. And if I did that, that would get me 1.50 times 10 to the minus four grams. We will put the 10 to the minus six grams on the bottom, one microgram up on top. And we will then divide that by basically one times 10 to the minus six. And that is going to give me 150 micrograms. 
I would highly recommend doing the conversion this way rather than trying to figure out the direct conversion from one prefix to the next, uh, because most people will frankly uh, screw it up. So you can always find on that table the prefix conversion that allows you to go from a prefix to the base unit, and then you can take it from the base unit to the next prefix unit, and you probably will always get the right answer. But some people try to move decimal places, add zeros, and they always will go the wrong way when they try to go from one to the next. So my recommendation would not do it like it shows here from the book, go prefix to prefix, but go prefix to base unit, base unit, prefix. At this point, I can actually finish the problem here because I have now that really what I'm looking for is 150 micrograms. And I know from the problem that there are 50 micrograms in every tablet. So if I were to finish out this calculation from where I left off, we would see that there are 50 micrograms in one tablet which means I do need to give the person basically three tablets in this particular case. Question on that. Now, sig fig wise, three tablets are really gonna be a counted sort of value, right? It's gonna be three. Sig fig wise, it really should probably end up at two significant figures, right? Because uh, the 0.15 has two significant, uh, three significant figures. The 50 point has two significant figures. So this one has two sig figs. This one has three sig figs. Really, the answer should be kind of 3.0 tablets if we were strictly significant figure wise, you know, sort of giving the answer. Clearly, you know, if you got something like 3.25 tablets in real life, you know, you're probably not going to sit there and talk about a tablet or a quarter of it. Uh, but they left it at three tablets, probably because it's more of a sort of counting number, but six big wise, you should probably end up at two. Any questions? So keep that in mind if you're going prefix to prefix, go back to the base unit, go from the base unit to the next prefix. Again, those are very easy sort of conversions to find. Um, how many minutes are there in 1.67 days? Here we go. There, we do know hopefully in one day there are 24 hours, and in one hour there are uh, 60 minutes. So, these again are qualities that we can use starting with 1.6 days. Going opposite of days, we'll start with our first equality, putting days on the bottom here, and 24 hours up on top. We stop right there, the days would cancel. We would be left with hours up on top. We need to get to minutes. So using our second equality here, going opposite, setting it up this way, we can clearly see hours are up on top. So on the bottom there, going to be one hour is 60 minutes. Hours will cancel. We're gonna multiply across the top there, 1.6 times 24 times 60. We're going to come back and divide by the bottom, but pretty much the bottom is all one. So that is uh, 2304, it's like on my calculator. Sig fig wise, it should end up at how many sig figs? Should be two. This is exact, that's exact. So we would default back to there. That is two sig fig. That takes me to here. So the answer should be, should be 2300. Again, not 23, although that is two significant figures, but a big difference again between 23 and 2300. So we don't want to super round. We also could have laid up a little scientific notation action if we felt like it and did a little of this as well. We could have done that also would be uh, two With us. All right. So uh, if your pace on the treadmill is 65 meters per minute, 
how many minutes will it take you to go 7.5 kilometers is the rate as a conversion factor. So you can pull that out of the problem, basically write two conversion factors of 65 meters over one minute. Or we can write one minute at 65 meters. Long as I'm entertaining myself, that's okay. No problem. <laughs> Our distance here is 7.5 kilometers. Can I use my conversion factor and my distance the way they are? No. I cannot because the distance part of my conversion factor is in meters, right? And the distance, the total distance is in kilometers. So once again, we're in different units. So you do have to do a conversion. It really doesn't matter which one you convert, but probably the easiest one to convert would be to take the kilometers into meters. So that's what I'm going to do. So using my uh, equality up here, I could get my conversion factors to do that. I obviously want to get rid of kilometers. So I'm going to put it on the opposite location, which means it will go on the bottom. And the 1000 meters will go up on top. When we divide that out, the kilometers will cancel. We'll take 7.5 times a thousand here. That gives me 7,500 meters. Now I'm good with my distance because now I got meters for my total distance and I have meters obviously in the conversion factors that I can use. So now it becomes really just a conversion factor problem. Uh, we'll start with my 7,500 meters. The conversion factor I should use, one on the left, one on the right, which one? one on the right so we're going to go one minute is 65 meters once again the meters here are going to cancel and uh looks like on my calculator i got something like one one five point three eight four six one five four minutes which obviously you know not to give me that many digits, right? So stick big wise, what are we looking at here? Yeah, pretty much everything's two. So the only sort of conversion factor that we use that was a real conversion factor is this one, which is an exact number. So we don't have to worry about it. We do have to really look at this number and obviously our original number, which had two significant figures. So everybody's got two. So we actually should take this to probably a 120 minutes. As two significant figures would be here, we would then need to round because it's five, right? To take it out. So I've been playing with the question on that one. So you do want to watch uh, different units, and it's a very common mistake that people make is kind of jump in with both sort of numbers, and you got to make sure for things to properly cancel out. If you want them to cancel, they got to be in the same unit. So you got to kind of watch this. Any questions on that? Okay, so we basically want to figure out how much time it's going to take to go a certain distance. And this is the distance that we want to travel. This is basically the rate at which we travel, it's like you're going to drive a car. If you drive 65 miles per hour, every hour you would go 65 miles and you set that speed up the whole time. In this case, every minute we're traveling 65 meters. So we want to use that rate to go from distance to time, uh, which is what we did here. So using the rate and our total distance moves us into time, which is ultimately what we're looking for. Before we could have done that, though, the problem was the total distance that we want to travel was in kilometers, while our rate was in meters. So those are two different units. So that's why we had to do first conversion here to get everybody into the correct unit so that we can talk correctly. If we went straight with the 7.5 kilometers and using meters per minute, nothing would technically cancel out. You would be left with technically a kilometer times minutes divided by meters. So nothing would work out right. So we got to get everybody in the same unit to cancel out. But usually whenever you want to go from like distance to time, you do have some type of rate, like you know how fast you're traveling per minute, per hour, per second. That's the bottom really two different quantities of units, distance to time is going to be the right. All right, 
Well, they agree. That's even better. All right, so why don't we try a couple more here just to make sure we are going to the local A and PM. Use the thirst oasis because the way it's been temperature wise seems like a good idea. I was there earlier today. I did go with crushed. I made two bites. Crushed bites. I like <laughs> All right, you get yourself a 32 fluid ounce drink and then a Coke. How many gallons would that be? Here are some of the qualities and the conversion factors that you could get from there. Set it up, see how much, how many gallons you're drinking in Diet Coke. Okay, let's take a look. So, uh, we're starting with 32 fluid ounces, which is what's given to us. We eventually want to find out how many gallons. So, this is sort of a pathway we could take. We could go for fluid ounces or Ports, the gallons. These are the two qualities that we have, the four conversion factors that you could use. Obviously, again, we're not going to use them all. We will start with our 32 fluid ounces here. Once again, the 32 fluid ounces are up on top. We do want to get rid of them. So looking at our first pathway here, we would want to use a conversion factor there on the left as that will get rid of our fluid ounces at this point. Once again, if we stop the calculation right at this point, the fluid ounces would cancel each other out. They both would divide out to one. And we're left with quarts. Once again, we don't want quarts, but we do want gallons. So that is where we would use our second quality to get us there. Setting it up like this, I could clearly see quarts are up on top. It tells me to get rid of them. I got to go opposite. So I would want to use the conversion factor on the right here. It has the quartz in the opposite location. So basically, we're going to be dividing by the quartz here. Four quartz on bottom, one gallon up on top. Quartz here will cancel. The one lonely unit left over is gallons, which is good because that is what we're looking for. We're going to take 32 times one times one and divide it by 32, hit equals, divided by four, hit equals, gives you 0.25 gallons. Apparently with no ice cream. I'll also <laughs> questions on that. By the way, the answer is not one over four because that makes me think you're just too lazy to provide it. And that's a, don't ever leave an answer as a fraction. That's not a terrible example, but I have had people give me an answer like 445 miles over 3,280 seconds. That could be the answer, which is terrible. Never ever leave it in the fraction, pretty much divide it out, get it in the Two thick figs, because basically everything in the middle of the sandwich here is an exact number, leaves us 32 on the outside, which is two significant figures and two significant figures on our hands here at the end. Question about that. Question about that. All right, so. All right, so uh, we got uh, another one here. During surgery, a patient receives five pints of plasma. How many milliliters for given? A couple of qualities and conversion factors to come up with here. A way to get us there, basically pints of quartz, quartz to milliliters. We would start with our uh, five pints. Again, we want to get rid of that. So using our first conversion factor here will allow us to do that. That gives me uh, two pints in one quart. Pints here will cancel, leaving us again quarts up on top. We want to go from quarts to milliliters and quarts are up on top, which means we got to go opposite to get rid of them. So we would use conversion factor there on the right. One quart is 946 milliliters. <laughs> Quartz here will cancel. We're going to multiply across the top there, which is five times 946. We're then going to come back actually and divide by the bottom, which is two. It equals, yields us uh, 2365. Big, big wise, what should we end up with? Oh, I thought a lot of numbers. Yeah. 
Nobody says four. Says four. I guess that's good, right? All right. So let us take a look here and analyze this like the professionals we are. Should we be concerned with this number here? No. We actually should. That's a measure to the English conversion. So we should look at this number, which is three. Courts of time seem like the same English English sort of conversion, which means we really don't need to worry about this guy. That's an exact number. This one has two, which means our answer actually should have a two, should then bring us to like 2,400. Or if you want to get fancy and scientific, 2.4 times 10 to the three, exactly how to write it. Fancy and scientific. So in this case, you really should look at the 946. And again, we look at the 946 because it's a crossover uh, court lines. All those things are kind of the same scale. They don't have to worry about it. So if we had to put the search number, would we be wrong? If you put the first number as in 2365? Yeah. Uh, you would be wrong in terms of significance. Oh, well, part of the answer would be. I imagine it might have an S. <laughs> Maybe it will say S after next to it for like significant figures. So, significant figure speaking, it is correct. Um, you should always give your answer the right number. After wise on your calculator it is correct. But again, your calculator does not fit out to you. I'll give you the next one. Say one more time. It will never, I will say never. It probably most questions will never ever ask give it to you the right number of significant figures. As a proper chemistry student, you should have it engraved in your head to always give everything the right number of significant figures. So even if it doesn't say, you should always give your answer to the right number of significant figures. Uh, that's just like a standard stuff that you should. Okay. Yeah. Um, not today. We'll catch you next. Time. <laughs> Everybody here? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Good roll. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to up the bus yet. Yeah. So if your if your question is uh, you know how many conversions would you use in a particular problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. the answer is it's hard to say. It depends on the problem. But <laughs> most conversion problems, if you pick an appropriate path to get you there, probably two to three is higher than most that you would probably use together. Um, essentially, you could go more, but there's usually an efficient way that you can probably, in most cases, get it done with two to three conversions. If it wasn't just a simple one off conversion. But now, I did all these conversions obviously all together in one big calculation, and you could do it that way. Uh, if you would rather, you could again get it, do the first conversion, get an answer, do the next conversion, get an answer, and then do the next conversion, get an answer. If you do it sort of in pieces like that, as I mentioned, try not to round to the very end. Otherwise, you kind of give yourself off up in the real answer. All right, one more 400 version. One more here. All right, you are stranded 145 miles away from home. You decide, hey, let's walk it. But it is only the hottest day of the year. Every day they keep saying that today really is the hottest day of the year. Um, if you uh, walk an average of 55 feet per minute, how many days is it going to take you to get home? Oh, don't quit. All right, come on. Mind you, you do not have a cell phone to call and Uber or anything like that. You're walking it. It's a nice, brisk 105 outside. Yeah, you're walking it. Yeah, you're walking it. You're walking it. It's a nice, brisk 105 out there. It only feels like 112. It's a similar to kind of one we did earlier uh we have like a total distance we want to go uh, we do have a rate that we can get from the actual problem which is we're walking 55 feet per minute we could really use that as a conversion factor if we needed to so really we're going to use that to go from distance to time we do have the same sort of issue we had earlier our overall distance is miles but our conversion factors is feet so 
once again, we should not use them together because the units will not properly cancel. You do need to do one conversion, either miles to feet, or you can take the feet to miles. I am going to convert the miles into feet. This seems easier. So I'm going to use that first equality that's on the bottom left. And I'm going to do the conversion to get rid of my miles. So I want to put it on the opposite side, bottom, and my feet up on top. That is going to cancel. I'm going to take a 125 times a 5280. That would be a 660,000 feet. Like a nice journey. Now that I have my distance here in feet, that's going to allow me to really use this properly because that's in feet as well. So everything will cancel out hopefully correctly. So I can carry down my number here. And I'm going to use the rate that was given to me in the problem as a conversion factor. And we are going to use it in this fashion so that the feet will cancel. That means we got a 55 feet on the bottom, a minute up on top. That is going to cancel the feet. And now we're in the units of time, minutes, which is good. But we do want days, so we got a few more conversions to roll with here. Minutes are up on top, so we do want to go opposite to cancel it. So there's 60 minutes and one hour. The minutes will cancel. We are now left with hours up on top, and we want to get to days. So we're going to use the last equality here and go opposite, which would be 24 hours in one day. The hours will cancel. We're then going to multiply across the top, which is basically 660,000. We're going to divide by 55, hit equals, divide by 60, hit equals, and divide by 24, and hit equals. That will get us an 8.3 days. A nice relaxing long time. If you set it up like this, you should get the right answer. I can't tell you how many people will do this problem in pieces. And decide instead of really dividing by 1624, they will end up multiplying by 1624 because they have no idea where the units are. So you do want to keep these guys separated so you can do the math correctly. Two sig figs off of which number? 55. 55. Yeah. So we do need to look at that one. The other conversion factors are exact numbers, so you don't need to work look at it. And that's why we end up with uh, two significant figures. Hopefully you pass the AMTM along the way to get me. Any question on problem solving, dimensional analysis, conversion? You do need to set it up. Something like this, showing the units and everything properly canceling out because you would like all the credit. If you don't care about all the credit, then you can show whatever you like. But if you like all the credit, that's what you need to show. You don't necessarily have to show the conversion factors separately or the qualities, and you can show the final setup with the units and the proper big big on the answers. And any questions on that? All right. All right. The next thing we're talking about here is density. Density of an object basically determines whether or not, for example, uh, something will sink or float in water. If something is more dense than water, it will sink. If something is less dense than water, it will float. The density of water is typically referred to as one gram per milliliter. Uh, that's liquid water. Density actually does change, um, but with temperature, but usually if you need a number for the density of water, it is one gram per milliliter. As you see here, all these floaty guys here are less dense, and obviously these solids here. If you have some liquids of different densities, what will happen is they basically will separate out in a different layer, right? where the more dense one would be the bottom, right? Less dense would be up on top. There's actually a formula that we use to calculate density. Density is mass divided by volume. So it is D is equal to M over V. Typical units of density are grams per milliliter, are grams per cubic centimeter. Remember that a milliliter is the same thing as a cubic centimeter, right? So 
cubic centimeters like you measure length times width times height, you get a three length measurement, you multiply them together, you have a volume. So those things are equal to each other. You do need to be able to rearrange this. So uh, volume would be mass divided by density. Divide, multiply the volume both sides, divided by density. Mass is volume times density. Some people like the DMV triangle. Density is mass divided by volume. Volume is mass divided by density. And mass is density times volume. So that's one way you can quickly remember it, I suppose. Uh, so the units here do not cancel out. So you will always end up with those two units, grams over milliliters or grams over cubic centimeters for most things. The number always stays with the grams part and it's always one milliliter or one cubic centimeter. So if something had a density of 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter, you could use it like a conversion factor. A cubic centimeter would be 3.5 grams. You actually use density like a conversion factor and use some dimensional analysis. Number always stays with the gram part of it, and it's always one milliliter or one cubic centimeter um, if you need to use it that way. Question. So as I mentioned, substances with higher densities uh, contain particles that are typically closely packed together. Lower densities are further apart. One unusual uh, characteristic of water is it's actually less dense in its solid state than in its liquid state. And that's unusual for a substance. We know that because when we do decide to occasionally to put ice in it, the ice cubes end up floating to the top, right? That's because it's actually less dense than the water part of it. That's because when water comes together, actually, there's a lot of open space between the different water molecules. It increases the volume of ice. That means the density actually decreases because density is mass divided by volume. So with all that extra volume, this number gets really big, which means the density gets small. We just mathematically divide that bottom number by a bigger number. These again are very common units uh, for solids and liquids. Again, it is typically our grams per milliliter, grams per cubic centimeter. For gases, which we really don't deal too much with density of gases in this class, grams per liter is the typical unit uh, that we really do come across. Uh, here's a table of some common density. And like I said, if you ever need the density of water, again, one is a very common unit that is actually uh, used. Anybody obviously with a higher density would sink down, a lower density would float. So we will uh, lay it up there for today. Let's talk about 